Bonjour, bonsoir. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a description of a class in screenwriting that I have taught periodically over the years. I taught it at UCLA and I've taught it at Columbia University. I uh, haven't taught it that much recently because I'm trying to discourage people from making movies. Uh, it consists of 10 classes, and uh, this will just walk through those 10 weeks. The, uh, this is a summary of those classes. So it's sort of a prospectus for a class I'm not giving. The uh, first week, I ask everyone in the film school who is interested in possibly taking the class to come for a lecture. And I get a, usually a pretty good room, at least 100 people, not this big. Uh, and in that class, I talk about my philosophy of screenwriting. And the class that I'm going to teach is really about philosophy plus technique, and it is something that I have learned. It's not an overview. It's not anybody else's method. There won't be any textbooks. Um, and, uh, and I really don't think there are any textbooks about screenwriting that make much sense because it is something you have to learn for yourself. And I think more damage has been done by books like Robert, by Robert McKee than have helped people because screenwriting is not, or any form of writing is not um, that predictable. What works for one person doesn't work for the next. Uh, it's, um, I'm only gonna teach my way. This is what has worked for me. This is what I've taught myself. It's how I began on my very first script and how I worked 50 years later last fall on my most recent script. So the method has not changed over the 50 years even though I've become more proficient at it. And uh, it uh, and it's really uh, best suited for first time writers. And it's suited for people of a certain kind of story, usually a narrative story, a linear story. Uh, it may not work so well for a comedy. It certainly doesn't work so well for a deconstructed story because it's kind of linear in its thinking. Uh, you could theoretically make it work for a deconstructed story, but uh, it's a little harder. I, I did, in fact, use it once for a deconstructed story. Uh, but the only way to teach anything about art is teach what works for you. And meaning me, or works for me. And it may not work for you. It probably won't. Uh, it may only work for a handful of you. But what you learn about art, you learn from people who have figured it out. You don't learn about it from people who are trying to tell you how to do it. They, you learn what they know. And this is what has worked for me. And if there's anything in it that you can steal or use, do so. If not, it will be uh, in, hopefully an interesting use of your time. Um, you know, is it really valuable to learn a method that maybe excludes 50% of scripts? Uh, it certainly is, because there's something in here that works that certainly has worked for me. Uh, so the opening class uh, begins with sort of my philosophy, which is that art is functional, that art works. It's very practical. It's like a tool belt that has a hammer on it and it has a pliers. And you can use these instruments to get things done. 
And that is how I came into screenwriting. I didn't come into it out of any desire to uh, be in the movies or be uh, known or make money. I wrote a screenplay because I was a film critic and screenplays were the format I knew. 10 years earlier, it would have been a novel. And 10 years later, or 50 years later, it would have been computer code. Uh, but it was the thing I knew, and so I, I came into it. And I was in a uh, period in my life where things were not working. And I was becoming something that frightened me. I was becoming uh, increasingly isolated, increasingly angry, increasingly alcoholic, and, uh, and increasingly depressed. And uh, I'd been traveling and living in my car for several weeks. And I had a pain in my stomach, and it was a, a bleeding ulcer. I was 25. I went in the hospital, and uh, I realized when I walked in the hospital that I hadn't spoken to anyone in a number of weeks. And I, I went in the hospital, and they gave me a room. And this metaphor came to me. And it was a metaphor of a big yellow taxi cab. And this taxi cab was floating through the sewers of the city. It was in Los Angeles. And there was a, a young man prisoned inside. And he couldn't get out. And everybody thought he was surrounded by people, but he was absolutely alone. And he was trapped in this floating yellow coffin. I said, that's who I am. I'm, the, I'm that guy. I'm that taxi driver. And, and that was the first time I had connected a uh, personal problem to a functional metaphor. We'll talk about metaphors in a second. But a metaphor is something that, that expands upon the problem and makes you understand it better. Uh, so uh, I um, got out of the hospital, I, I wrote that script. I swore I would never have peanuts before talking. <laughs> um, I, um, I wrote that script, and, uh, and then I just uh, traveled around the country for a while, and got my mental health back. So I didn't write it to uh, sell it, I wrote it to, I didn't want to become this kid, this kid who I called Travis Bickle. And I felt that the only way not to become him was to externalize him and therefore exercise him the same way you would do with a voodoo doll and stick him with all your uh, venomous pins. And uh, so that's what I did with the story. And uh, so that if you believe that, what I believe, then you here are your own material. Your material is not elsewhere. Your material is not in the newspapers or the TV shows and the books and the manga. Your material is essentially yourself. You have to study yourself and not movies, although of course you will study movies, but you have to study what it is that is making you think you might need to write, or tell a story, or paint, or sing a song. And so that in terms of this class we're going to take, I need some partners to share this exploration. And I'm not interested in 10 good writers. There's always 10 good writers. I don't want to spend the next 10 weeks with 10 good writers. I want to spend the next 10 weeks with 10 interesting people. And then we'll find out if they can write. So if you want to uh, take this class, I want you to write down in two sentences your most pressing personal problem at this moment. Also write your age, your sex, your race, et cetera. 
so I get a heterogeneous group of people. I don't want them all to be the same. And uh, I will uh, go through those responses. I will go through them actually quite quickly. I'll just go them to the, to the extent that I'm interested, I'm not interested, I'm interested. And I will find 10 interesting people. And you will be asked to come back next week. The other submissions will be th thrown away, discarded, and, you know, never be seen or remembered again. If you, in fact, are chosen, your answer then becomes the public property of the class. It is no longer your own. And uh, you have to be prepared for that. Because when you talk about storytelling, we're in the dirty laundry business. Nobody particularly is interested in our freshly washed laundry. Uh, and if you have a problem holding up your dirty laundry and your soiled thong to the public, then maybe you shouldn't be in this class. Uh, and if you can handle that, uh, you know, I'd love to have you. Uh, and so what you have to look for is something that is yours. Now, it won't be uniquely yours because there aren't that many unique problems in the world. Uh, but it will have to be the sand in your particular oyster. It will have to be that thing that is agitating you that you would like to find a way to represent. And uh, so that usually clears out a good part of the audience um, because uh, about half the students, you know, just don't feel that they're up for that kind of class because that's just really not a screenwriting class. They can feel it already. This is group therapy. And, uh, and you know, is this a commercial approach to movies? It probably is, in a way, particularly for a beginning writer. Because if you're thinking, I can become a successful writer by copying a movie I just saw, why would they want you to do that? They've got hundreds of people who can copy that movie. In fact, they're all copying it right now. Why would they hire you? Why would they fool around trying to teach you how to do what everybody else knows how to do already? So the only thing that you have as an entree is something that is relatively unique to you. Now, as I just said, the problem won't be unique to you, but your metaphorical approach will probably be unique to you. Uh, and so that's, that's what I'm interested in, and I'm interested in uh, 10 people. So then I uh, collect the papers, and I select uh, 10 students. And after you've done it uh, a while, they fall into certain boxes. There will always be the overweight girl. There will always be the kid who can't come out of the closet yet, although fewer and fewer each year. Uh, <laughs> now I suppose there's going to be the kid that can't go back in the closet. Um, and there will be always the uh, you know, kid who wants to uh, kill uh, a parent. There will be the minority uh, student who wants to kill the majority uh, student. And, uh, and then there will be a few other interesting ones, and you, you pick out uh, 10 people. And you come back the second week, and everyone has to read their problem publicly. And then they are discussed. So the poor, overweight girl has to read a problem about being overweight or not being attractive or whatever. And then it's actually discussed. And it's, it's humiliating. And, um, but um, if you're not comfortable with humiliation, then I, you know, I don't watch my class. Um, and I'm, I don't know if I'm going to watch your film, to watch your film either. 
And uh, so that is a little rocky the first week because uh, people can be cruel. And when they're not cruel enough, I can incite them to be cruel. And so that you get an, an atmosphere of exposure, which then, then of course r results in a certain degree of bonding. And then the next task is to come up with a metaphor or multiple metaphors. And the next week, we will do a metaphor. And I'm just going to put these steps up here. So the next class is, let's come up with a metaphor. So each of you have your problem. Now you've got to come up with your metaphor. Now what is a metaphor? Well, a metaphor is not a simile. It's something else. A simile is like or as. Uh, you know, uh, my heart is like a dying star. That's a simile. A metaphor is something that stands apart from the problem, yet is somehow linked to its secret. So that yellow taxi cab is a metaphor for loneliness. Uh, at least it is for me. And it turned out over the decades to be for other people too. And uh, Scorsese and I realized that we had successfully used the metaphor when uh, in the editing of the film, we, uh, there was more talk in the narration about loneliness. And I said to Marty, I said, you know, we don't really need all that talk about loneliness. He does mention it. And that's enough, because every time we see that big yellow cab, we see it. And that yellow cab is so much more effective as a visual representation than is the narrative words. So you know, we knew the metaphor was good. And, the, uh, and many uh, great films are inherently strong because the metaphor is simply so strong. You know, Frankenstein, the metaphor for mechan uh, mechanical progress. Now, they don't have to actually talk about the machine age while making the Frankenstein film. But, every, but you know that's the anxiety that is driving that story. We are making machines that are doing human things. Uh, and great films often have great metaphors. The golem, and if you look at, back at history, you'll see the great metaphors. You know, the golem for uh, the um, the unknown evil, uh, Rosemary's Baby, uh, Jaws. Uh, once you get a rock solid metaphor, boy, this task gets much easier. And I remember when someone told me about um, the idea for, where, what was the film called, where you, the horror film where you couldn't make noise? What? A quiet place. And I heard it and I said, wow, that's it. That's a stone metaphor. Flipping it so that everything you associate with fear goes the other way. So if you associate scary sounds with fear, create a story where you associate no sound with fear. And then everything gets born again. So, uh, and over the years, I found different metaphors. Um, we, they showed Light Sleeper the other night, and I was 
at that point, the problem was a, a midlife crisis. I had turned 40, and I was trying to think of a midlife movie. And I went through all the midlife cliches and quitting the college and dropping out with a student and getting a sports car and traveling across South America and joining the Foreign Legion and whatnot. I mean, just cliche after cliche. They were bad metaphors. They were weak metaphors. They didn't enrich the problem. They just diminished the problem. If you have a guy with a midlife crisis and he takes off with his co-ed in a red sports car, you are learning nothing. You're just reinforcing the shallowness of your idea. So you have to have something that makes it richer. And I spent maybe six months looking for the metaphor. I spend more time looking for metaphors than I do for looking for stories. Because once you have a metaphor, a story will come. And, uh, and then one night, uh, about four in the morning, I had a dream, and in this dream, a drug dealer that I once knew came very vividly to my face. His name was John. And he was so close to me that I woke up in a start. And I said, wow, that was vivid. I haven't seen him in a year. Why was that so vivid? What were we talking about? And uh, I said, he was asking me about the movies, what movies he should see. I said, that's it. That's my midlife Metaphor, this 40-year-old drug delivery boy whose boss is quitting to start a cosmetics company and he has no skills. That's interesting. There's really exploration inside that idea. And an hour later, I was at my desk making notes. Later that day, I tracked down the real-time prototypes. And uh, later that night, I met with them told them I wanted to uh, do their story, you know, or my story through them. And, uh, and uh, Cynthia, who soon surrounded, ended up playing in the movie, said, I'll call you tomorrow. She called me tomorrow and she said, well, I spoke to Bertolucci and Michael White and they say you're okay. <laughs> so uh, that's how Light Sleeper came about. And uh, so, uh, and sometimes, a metaphor it works that way, or sometimes you go into material and find the metaphor in the material. It may be a novel, it may be a historical situation. You know, uh, is there a metaphor inside wa uh, the Battle of Waterloo for you? So Scorsese asked me to do The Last Temptation of Christ. Now there are probably five or six different movies in that book. 600 page book. And I needed to find the metaphor in that book that, um, uh, that was right for me. And in fact, I, I, I'll be have, handing out all these outlines, but I wrote it right on the outline. It was a quote from the author, Nikos Katanzakis It is not God who will save us, it is we who will save God by battling by creating and transmitting matter into spirit. And I said, that's it. That's, my, that's the problem I'm interested in, and it's inside this book, and I'm gonna find it. I'm gonna find the plot that works. Uh, so now the students come back the next week with their metaphors. And as is predictable, they're quite weak because they're not really thinking metaphorically, they're thinking comparatively. You know, what is my problem like? Not what is the standard for my problem? And therefore, as a class, we can address that to start to come up with things. So, you know, you have the student who can't tell his parents that he's homosexual and he has this great Metaphor. It's about a student who can't tell his parents he's homosexual. <laughs> and, um, and he's not going to learn much about his problem, and, uh, and uh, it's going to be pretty predictable and boring, unless he happens to be a Proust or some kind of genius. And uh, 
So when I we said, well, what can a metaphor be? And in a case like that, you throw out metaphors. You know, what about a man who's a spy, who's literally undercover, and he wants to come in from the cold, and no one in his immediate family knows that he has been a spy against his own country for maybe a decade. And he's trying to figure out how to finesse this so he doesn't lose his family, yet he doesn't have to be a spy anymore. Well, now we're talking about coming out of the closet. Now you've got a spy there, and you've got spy craft, and you've got good spy plot stuff, and you've got intrigue, and you've got people running from each other in the dark. And all you're really talking about is telling your dad you're gay. Uh, and you learn a lot about what you're trying to tell by putting it in that other world. I had a student once who was a, uh, a Nisei, a first generation Japanese, was in Los Angeles. And he wanted to do a film about his family. And uh, his uh, uh, attempted assimilation into Los Angeles culture. And of course, that's what he was writing about. And, and there was an article in the paper that morning, that morning in the Los Angeles Times, and it was about the lowriders in LA, the, the, the Chicano gangs. And I said to him, you know, you should go down there. You know, this, this is the part of town they hang around, they have the street races down there. And just go down there and say you're a student from UCLA and you want to uh, write about their culture. Can you hang with them? I said, you know, what, what's going to do? What, what's going to happen? They're going to tell you to piss off. They're going to throw a rock at you. Big deal. You know, just try it. See what happens. And so he did. And they said, hey, you know, you know, sure, homie, come and join. So he hung with them for a while. And then he wrote um, his story about his assimilation. And at that time, it, it was called a movie, it was a movie called Boulevard Nights, got made. And it was about uh, Chicano street racing gangs. But it was a film about his family. It was a film he couldn't write because he was too close to it. And so that is, you know, the things that metaphors can do. Uh, so that, The, uh, so, you know, moving on to, you know, let's say we take the unattractive girl. You know, well, what is the metaphor for that? Is it maybe a movie star? Is that how far you have to twist it? You know, can you find a metaphor for your worthlessness in a woman who's so beautiful that no one thinks they're real, maybe you can. Maybe that is the metaphor you're looking for. Maybe it's not. But don't be afraid to reach out uh, to an uncomfortable place because anybody who knows you and knows that you have zero uh, self-worth and you say I'm writing a script about the most glamorous movie star of the decade, they're going to laugh at you. Well, maybe that's what you need to hear. Maybe that's going to do it for you, a few good laughs. Uh, and uh, so then they come back with better, I, I, the ones that have metaphors that are reasonably functional, I said, now come back with some plot. The ones that don't have metaphors are there yet, I said, let's come back with some more metaphors. Now, plot, you know, most people, when they think of screenwriting, they think of plot first. What happens in the movie? I think plot probably comes about, you know, third. First was what happens is what is the what is the core problem that is agitating the need for the story? What is the thing that stands in for the problem? And then how does the problem move through the thing? What happens when loneliness gets inside the cab and starts driving around the city? Now that's plot. And um, and plot is relatively simple and basic, certain things happen. 
you know, you can just imagine that, you know, you, you take a, you take a, uh, a spy, you know, our spy friend who almost gets caught, you know, that becomes the opening scene, well, that's something that happens. And then you realize, you don't realize that he's a spy, and he doesn't get caught, and then you realize, in fact, he is a spy, and he's talked his way out of it. Now, what's the next step? What's the next step? What can happen next? Does he have a friend? Does he have a wife? Where does he live? You know, just start imagining. And uh, so, the uh, the fourth class. And you know, this just starts the tradition of surmise. What happens? Okay, you have a movie star with zero self-worth. How does that manifest itself? You know, um, does she cut herself? If she does, how does she hide that? Uh, does she pay people to humiliate her? On, on the sly, you know, like Belle de Jour. Uh, you know, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm literally coming up with this stuff off the top of my head now. This is not written down. I'm, I'm just doing what, um, what writers do, just imagining. You know, you ride along the street and you think of something. And uh, so the, the plots begin. And you get some rudimentary idea of a plot. Somebody, I had a, one student once whose problem was that as a teenager, he had killed a girl in an auto accident and he just couldn't get it off his mind. He wasn't guilty of anything, but it was just an image. He was a pedestrian school kid. And just the idea of hitting that girl was, you know, post-traumatic post stress. He couldn't get over it. And I, I took him into the class immediately because, you know, that's an interesting problem, like all PSD problems. And, uh, you know, and we started to find, you know, a metaphor for him. And, um, and one we came up with was a woman who thinks, who sees a child, well, a woman who had an, uh, uh, an unwanted abortion, but she doesn't think she did. She thinks the child was stolen from her and sold. But she's been told all her life that it miscarried or aborted or whatever. And then she's going down the street, and she sees that girl. She says, that's my child. There she is. Well, that's an interesting thing to happen. It's a good expression of the problem of this kid who's obsessing on this girl he killed. Then I said, well, what comes next? Well, maybe you flip the story. Maybe you tell it from the viewpoint of the 13-year-old who this older woman is now uh, pestering. And she doesn't understand why the older woman is pestering and the older woman is pestering her because she thinks she's her mother. Uh, so that is the simple business of plot exploration. And that leads to the next step. Screenwriting is not a form of literature. It is not a form of writing. Your words do not appear on screen. Uh, it is a form of storytelling. And it has a lot more to do with that time your uncle came home and said that, that uh, the bird dog 
wouldn't bring the bird back and they had to shoot the dog because he was, the dog was no good to hunt anymore. That's a story. That's oral tradition. That's the stories you're raised up with. You know, the time your grandfather fell down the stairs and um, thought he was married to another woman. That's a good story. And take my word for it, I'm making this stuff as I go along. Um, and so, tell a story, tell me a story. Oral tradition. So now, let's imagine a story. Now, so now in the class you got a, you've got your problem and your metaphor, now you start telling a story. So uh, let's just say, uh, these two, okay, these two stoner kids skip school to get stoned and play video games. And their friend shows up, and they have this ratty old video game set that doesn't really work. And they're complaining about it. And their friend shows up with a brand new state-of-the-art PlayStation and a brand new monitor. And they're all so jacked. And, and they're all excited about doing that. Okay, what happens next? Well, you, you gotta think of something to happen next because otherwise you're just gonna get stuck with these three stoners sitting there playing video games. And, um, you know, uh, Raymond Chandler once said that if you're stuck with a story, have someone walk in the room with a gun because the reader will be so glad he's there, they won't ask how he got there. <laughs> and the same thing is sort of true when you're telling a story, oral tradition, you're telling a story and you realize that you're stuck. So you say, okay, then this red convertible pulls up and these two huge black guys, like football line players, linebackers, in, in, in purple suits, pull up to this house, and they get up and they go inside. Okay, I've got you back again. Yeah, boy, do I have you back. I've also got these two black linebackers in purple suits that I don't know what the heck to do with. I've got to very quickly figure out how I can get that story of the black thugs into the stoner story. <laughs> you know, okay, well, how can they be related to the stoners? You know? Uh, maybe they think they stole something. Maybe they thought, you know, come up with something. And that is the heart and genius of the oral tradition. Because you are now creating in live time. Stories should not be written, they should be told. And if you have to learn to tell your story. So you tell it. You know, maybe it's only 10 minutes long. You know, you say to your friend, um, let me buy you a beer, let me buy you a coffee. I got a story, I'm just thinking about it. I wonder if you, and you tell the story. And you, you see if it catches their interest. But of course, while you're telling it, you're expounding on it. So if you came, you sat down and you had a story with, four or five items on it. You tell it to them and now you're getting interested in it and you realize by the time you finished it, there are now six or seven items. You've added a couple of scenes. So you're into the next phase already. So you start out like, and maybe your first outline is just a few items long. Um, but when you come back from that coffee or that beer, you re-outline it because you, now you've just thought of some other things. So maybe it, you had a little story with 10, 10 scenes in it, but now it's 15 scenes. Oh, don't we'll tell it again. And each time you tell it, you're not really interested and whether the person likes your idea or what they think of your idea, you're interested in 
their body language, their reaction. Do you own them? And you can tell if you own them. You can tell it in their eyes. You can tell it in their restlessness. And if you own them, you own them. And if you don't, you have to come up with something. You have to find those two guys in the purple suits. You have to find that comic relief guy. You have to be going down the street and a beautiful woman falls out of a window and dies in front of you. Anything to get them back. Um, and then you, you, know, and you say, well, that kind of worked. That uh, the girl with the red dress and the, and the yellow hair falls down and cracks her skull open. And they really bought that. How, I wonder how I can work that into the story. Um, and so it built. Now, by the time, if you can tell a story for 45 minutes and hold somebody, you have a movie. And if you can't, you should not write it. Uh, you should be able to, at some point, be telling somebody a story, get to a certain junction, get up, go to the bathroom and come back and start another conversation. If they don't ask you what happened to that story, you know you're in trouble. <laughs> so uh, then, so every time you outline, every time you tell the story, you outline it. And it gets better, or it starts, two things happen as you repeatedly outline and relate a story. And they're both very good things to happen. One is the story dies. It just gets sick. You get sick of it, it gets sick of you. Now that is a very good day, because that means you have just saved yourself three months of writing a script that nobody wants to read. That is a happy day. There's nothing more debilitating for a writer to write script after script that nobody likes. You do that three, four times and you're done as a writer. If you can avoid writing scripts that nobody's gonna to wanna to read or make, that's a good day for you. The other thing that can happen is the script gets sick of being told. You're finally, you're finally telling it and at some point the script starts talking to you and says, okay, enough of this. I, I got it now, okay? Let's go back to the typewriter. You know, let's go to the board processor. It's, it's time to go to work. And then, of course, that's also a very great day because now the script wants to be written. And you have outlined it in length. And uh, I have a whole series of outlines here. Um, the, uh, and on, on uh, let's see, I have Last Temptation, Light Sleeper, Mosquito Coast, Gigolo, I think I have, yeah, on Gigolo, I have two outlines here. So this is a long time ago. The first one is 44 scenes and 85 pages. And the second one is 48 scenes and 114 pages. So in between those two outlines, it expanded by 15 pages. Now, how did I know how to expand it? I simply did by uh, uh, telling a story and figuring it out. Uh, and in that case, when I was beginning to learn to write, I used to even color code these outlines uh, by exposition, action, humor, uh, romance. So I can actually look at the outline in different colors and say, wait a second, you got three exposition scenes in a row here. And then you got a comedy, an action, a comedy. That's not, you know, switch them around. And, and, then, and you'll figure that out when you tell it in person. So um, as I get into what I actually think an outline is, I have, uh, about 20 copies here of various outlines. And uh, I'm not gonna ask for them back. Uh, so, you know, you can just look at them among yourselves and uh, refer to them and maybe someone from Forum uh, can help me 
just uh, pass them out. There will be a there will be a test afterward. Uh, and what you will see in these outlines, and here's some more, is a meticulous preparation. I, there are writers I know of who figure out what they're writing while they write. I, I don't. I can't write the first scene until I know the last scene. I can't write the first scene until I know uh, the first sentence and the title. And, uh, and if you look at these outlines, some of them in particular, uh, if you look at Last Temptation of Christ or Mosquito Coast, they will have several columns on them. Last Temptation of Christ, 46 scenes, 106 pages. Now, so I'm looking at it right here, and it says, you know, Jesus awakes. Um, for first scene, I clock it in at a half page. Now, you're sort of operating on a page a minute. So I'm saying that first scene, Jesus awakes, I, I'll be good for a half page. Uh, the next scene makes cross. I put that down as a page. So now I'm going through my whole outline. I haven't written a word yet. And I'm telling myself that on scene 32, he discusses his betrayal with Judas. The page lasts, it lasts on one and a half pages. It begins on page 73 and it ends on page 74 and a half. And I haven't written a single word yet. And I'm still, I'm already clocking. Uh, where these uh, scenes uh, will come out. What I do in an outline like that is you see I have the, the estimated page count and then when I finish the scene I scratch it out and then I have the real page count. So if I start deviating, if I'm writing a, a scene on page 75 that I predicted I would write on page 80, one of two things are, have happened. One is the previous material has just gotten better, and I'm in the right place on page 80. The other is I'm fat, and I get, I, I, I'm five pages fat. Because movies occur in continuous time. You can't shut down the book and pick it up again tomorrow. You can't walk around the art gallery and return to the painting. Therefore, a scene which is good on page 35, the very same scene is not necessarily good on page 45 because it exists in a time continuum. And the scene can be the same, but if it's late, it's, it's lame. So that's why I do these page counts. And, uh, you know, that's, if you're looking at the one from Mosquito Coast, that's almost indecipherable. Um, but it's all little notes to myself. And I like to do it on a single page so I can carry the page around with me and look at it. So here's a light sleeper. And here's Mosquito Coast. So there's Mosquito Coast. And I can just look at it and uh, think, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And, uh, and I have it always with me. You know, some people have this idea about putting three by five cards on a board, but you can't look at a three by five card board and see the whole movie. And I can see this. And I have, on occasion, um, stopped and re outlined because my page count was wrong. And I wanted to fix my page count. Uh, I have had a couple cases where I realized the outline was wrong and I abandoned the project. And that, I think, I did that a couple years ago and I, I think I failed because I didn't do 
I didn't obey my lesson to do oral tradition long enough. I think I got about 20, 30 pages from the right ending, and I, and I started faking it, and I just jumped into writing. Well, then I hit that spot where I was faking it, and, and I was dead. And um, so, you know, to try to be careful to make sure, you, for me, you don't start writing a script until you know how it's going to end, because what's going to happen is you're just going to keep postponing all your, your inability to end the story. And the more you postpone it, the more out of sync you get with, this, with the oral tradition and the screenwriting story. So I am uh, I'm going to start directing a film in about four or five weeks. And uh, I'm not passing it around because they told me that that wasn't a wise thing to do. Um, and, uh, but here it is, you know, the same thing that you have in front of you. And I worked off this outline to write the script. Um, and that's the, uh, the, the method that works for me. So now you have students doing outlines. When their outline gets to a certain point, they start telling their stories. And they have to tell them to each other out of class and also sometimes tell them in class. Sometimes there's not enough time in class to hear all the stories so they get assigned to tell them to each other. And then certain ones get told in class. When they, their outline gets to a point where it has strength for them and where they feel confident in it uh, and where other people are interested in it, then, that, then, I am allow, then I allow them to write. Now that's the seventh class. It's a 10 week class. No one's gonna finish the script on time. It's impossible because you spend seven weeks not allowing them to write. So all the scripts will turn up, you know, three, four, six months later, and they'll get their grades. But that's, you know, just the uh, particular way I choose to do it. And, uh, and I think of those page counts the way a marathoner might think of running a marathon. He looks at his watch. You know, when I pass the red house with the blue awning, if I'm in the right place, I should be an hour and 13 minutes, or an hour 13 minutes and a half along. If I'm faster than that, I should calibrate why I'm faster. And if I'm below that, I've got some other problem going on. So as you're running your marathon, you're looking at your milestones and your road marks telling you how much in the groove you are. Uh, so that is essentially the class itself. You have a few more um, weeks, and so I devote them to more practical things like script format and so forth. Uh, the, 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 to me, there really is no script format, um, although you know, Final Draft tries to mandate how a script looks. Uh, I wrote my first script as chapters without scene numbers. You know, Travis buys a gun, Travis meets Betsy, Travis drives. And uh, just little chapters. I wrote first reform as chapters without, without numbers. I wrote the new one in chapters without numbers. Then, of course, the, um, the, um, the line producer has to go through all the work of numbering it because how do you prepare a budget and a board without numbers? But for me, it works better without numbers. Um, uh, I've written a script in the past tense. Um, I've written a script in... Um, Zowie language, like comic book language, you know, 
bing, bang, boom, all that. Each story sort of tells you how it wants to be written. And so don't get so hung up on what they tell you a script is supposed to look like. If a script reads well, that's all that matters. And it's the same thing with acts. How many acts are there in a movie? Well, mostly there are three because we live in the past and the present and the future. We like to think in triads. But in fact, some movies have five acts, some movies have one act, some movies have two acts. You know, and don't let anybody, any school or any textbook tell you it has to be three acts. It doesn't have to be. And don't let anybody tell you you can't have a scene that's 10 minutes long where nothing happens. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen First Reformed, but six or seven minutes into the movie, there's a 12-minute scene where two people just talk. Now, if I had a screenwriting teacher, he'd make me change that. But I knew that it was right, and I knew that if that scene didn't work, I shouldn't write the script. And if the scene did work, the script would work. So, you know, be careful about all these, you know, there are, there's a reason why people teach screenwriting and don't make a living at it. Just think about it. Uh, so, I, uh, so then I also do some exercises for them because two of the most difficult things to do in scripts is uh, exposition. It's certainly the most difficult. Exposition is the bane of, of writers. And you need it. Now, you need less than you used to because audiences are more savvy. But so I give you an exercise Exposition exercise. A man is in a, a town. He has lived here before. He meets somebody in the supermarket who he recognizes, but he doesn't indicate that. And then she recognize. Then her daughter comes and recognizes him. And he is, um, let's say, I'm making this up. He's uh, the brother of that girl's dead sister, okay? And he used to be a cop. And he lost his job because um, he got drunk and beat up a suspect. And then he left town, and then his wife died, and his sister won't talk to him anymore. Okay, now, I, that's a lot of exposition. So I say this to us, okay, that's the exposition exercise. Two and a half pages. Come back next week, I want that in two and a half pages. Well, they can't do it. It's just too much damn exposition. But it's sure fun to see how they watch them try. Because they're gonna come up with all kinds of devices, you know, and some of them are gonna be very lame, you know. And uh, didn't that, wasn't that person used to be in the, in the a policeman with you? You know, boom, 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 acquisition. And so that uh, students sort of understand how devious and crafty you have to be about exposition. Because uh, most, you, you can tell it in really uh, poorly written uh, scripts by uh, inexperienced writers, because they just put the exposition right on the table. You know, uh, you know, I, I was, I, I didn't know what to do, you know, with my, my sister got hit by a car, and boom. So that's a good class to have. They, they learn about exposition. And then I do another class on um, dialogue, which is always tricky, because people don't talk the way they think, or they don't talk the way you want them to talk. Uh, on the other hand, oddness in scripted dialogue is not as odd as it is in daily dialogue. So you have to find a kind of a cadence where people are talking, but 
they're always slightly out of sync, or they're in sync, and then they burst out of sync, and they come back in, and, and you create a rhythm of dialogue. So I give them yet another exercise, another one of these horrendous exercises, mother and a daughter sitting on a subway bench, talking, blah, blah, blah. And here's what they talk about, the girl, I don't know, wants to drop out of college, the mother doesn't want her to drop out of college because she dropped out of college and she always regretted it. But the girl says, but you became successful anyway, but that doesn't mean you're gonna become successful anyway. Um, I say, okay, and I run through all these things they talk about, and I say, you know, give that to me in a page and a half, two pages, next week. And they come back and they uh, read their dialogue. And you know, most often it's kind of trite. And I do something that works quite often, which is I'll have the two students read the scene, but I'll have them read it in reverse, which is last line first, second to last line second, third to last line third. So now they're reading it backwards. And you know what? It's more interesting. <laughs> because there are connections that are being made. People are answering questions that haven't been asked yet. And they're asking questions that have already been answered. Well, that's a kind of oddness that invigorates the listener. Now, a little of this goes a long way. You, you can't do a whole movie in reverse, although uh, Gaspar Noe tried. Um, the, uh, and so then now they have an exercise in dialogue. We have one class left, and I then bring in another screenwriter who, um, who disagrees with virtually everything I've said. There's a few more. Uh, the, uh, who, uh, yeah, maybe you could just take them up, up there. I, I don't know if any of these outlines got, you know, toward the top of the room. Could, 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 did any of them get up there at all? Oh, okay, all right. Yes, good. Um, and uh, so I, uh, you know, I used to be a night writer. I would start at about 11 or 12, right till 5 or 6, on a kind of regimen of caffeine and nicotine and alcohol and cocaine. And when I was young enough to pull that off, you could get a lot of work done. There were a fair amount of spelling errors, but other than that, it was really kind of good because you know, I've just had this image of all these little people hiding inside my typewriter who wouldn't come out for free and who had to be bribed. And they had all kinds of little addictions. And, but you could get them to come out. And once they came out, they would run around the desk and play and say all kinds of interesting things. And, uh, and that was sort of how I wrote until I got married and had a child and then realized I couldn't write at night anymore. Thankfully, I would be dead and uh, became a day writer. But I had another friend who was a comedy writer, a very good comedy writer. And he would get up about six in the morning and smoke a J and he'd write to about nine or 10 and he'd go to bed and that was his regimen. So I uh, would get someone like him to come and be a guest in the class just to make the point that everything I've been telling you the last 10 weeks may not apply to you. you know, and don't be uh, intimidated by saying that was an interesting class, but it, it's irrelevant to my work, work process. And uh, that, is the end of my lecture on screenwriting.
Alors nous avons un peu de temps pour les questions, donc je ne suis pas celui qui vient pour dire que tout ce que vient de nous raconter Paul... Quand je parle, ça marche. Si je ne parle pas, ça ne fonctionne pas, évidemment. Euh, vous pourrez poser des questions, euh, évidemment, you très can ask, uh, as many precise questions as you want. It can be either in French or in English, but you have to wave so that Paul can see you. It's always more pleasant to see the face of the person who's talking to you. My first question, just to start, uh, I think you once said that when you're writing, when you're writing a script, you should never give any uh, information in terms of mise-en-scène or directing. As a scriptwriter, you're not supposed to stand uh, for a director. Do you still think that? And when you are just a director and you haven't written the script, uh, do you also uh, choose the same method or you just leave them as they are as scripts? No, I, I write a screenplay as a screenwriter, not as a director. So you're writing problem, metaphor, plot, dialogue, exposition, character. You're not describing, you know, the sunset. And, um, and you're doing the stuff that you know a script has to do. Um, and if it works, then that. And, then, and occasionally, obviously, physical descriptions and stuff will, will come to play. But you're using the tools of language and oral storytelling. Then, should you be so fortunate, you have to rethink the entire thing into visual ideas. And you have to look at that poor script you wrote and say, how can I save this with images? You know? And then you rethink it all. <coughs> and you transmogrify it into what you can make images do. So, you know, an image is an idea, which is uh, something that took me quite a while to learn. And so uh, you can say a glass of water. Well, this is not a glass of water. A glass of water is four words. Or, or is it three in French? Anyway, it, it's four words. This is not four words. This is an object, and it is what it is. And when it's over here, it's a different object, a different idea. I pour some water out of it, and it's another idea. So you have to think, okay, these, these words, what do they really mean visually? And when I wrote that they were in a restaurant, and now I'm thinking about it, wouldn't it be more interesting if they were in a video arcade? No, it wouldn't, no, it wouldn't. What do we want to say if they were in a bank? It's a bank more. So now you're rethinking everything visually. You know, um, you know, what if, you know, what if he inserts on button and he keeps trying to button it and it doesn't quite button it? You start thinking little visual things where you're going to do a little close up on the button, which you didn't put in the script, but you realize now visually it might be interesting. And uh, and if you get too hung up on that at the script level, particularly if you don't direct it, you're trying to jump to the next stage. Mm -hmm of visually reimagining the story. And you're going to hurt yourself as a storyteller if you jump ahead and um, think of it visually. At least I found that. Alors, vous pouvez maintenant prendre la parole. Donc, il va y avoir la première, une question ici. So we have a first question from the audience. Well, um, good night, and thank you for sharing your method uh, with us. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, unless it escaped for me or I wasn't paying enough attention, I don't remember you put or you spoke about characters or as the protagonist or the hero as your main uh, elements. I know there's kind of always this uh, um, battle between plot and character, what comes first. So 
I wanted to know like what what is your approach to to character, and also as a, a second maybe small question, if you're um, if you know a little about John Truby and his method, I know he's more than a script doctor, but John, John Truby. John Truby? Truby? Uh, you don't know about him? No. Okay. Well. <laughs> I've never read a book on screen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I guess we can skip that question. <laughs> we stay only with the character and plot. Uh, thank you. Yeah, you no, know, I mean, it's pretty clear to me that character comes before plot. So uh, if the problem comes first, then the metaphor comes second. For me, the metaphor is usually the occupation. Uh, so, uh, so then you have a character who the, pl the problem is inability to express love. You've chosen the metaphor of a gigolo. Now you start thinking about plot. What can happen? How can this express itself? And so for me, plot comes out of character. And, um, and character, the, the essence of character is contradiction. I love my wife so much I hit her. That's character. I loved her so much I hit her again. That's even more character. And so out of these characters start come plots. And the really interesting characters are people who do things against their own best interests and don't understand why. So Travis Bickle says, I have to get healthy while he's drinking and taking pills. That's, you can call that plot, but that's character. And the fact that, okay, so you have a taxi driver. You have a, uh, a lonely guy in a cab. There we are. What can happen? Well, he sees a girl he wants who he cannot have. He sees a girl who he can have who he doesn't want. He tries to kill the father figure of one and fails. He kills the father figure of the other and succeeds and becomes a hero by mistake. That's all the plot. That's the, I just told you the entire plot. And it all just came out of character. You know, how, do, how does a man construct a world that defeats him? And I thought that script, when I wrote it, was about loneliness. By the time I finished the script, I realized it was about self-created loneliness, which is a different thing. Another question. Uh, hi, Paul. Uh, Why do you think of Campbell writing Joseph Campbell and theory of monomyth? Is it an influence for you and if you have any esteem for it? Uh, yeah, I, well, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, it's basically true. But, again, you know, he's talking from Mount Olympus and George Lucas is reacting from Mount Olympus. And I don't work at Mount Olympus. Uh, and occasionally I create characters that have Olympian features. But I, I start at ground level. And sometimes they don't get to the top of the mountain. And so uh, for me to take the point of view of the mythological cosmic overview, uh, would intimidate my own truthfulness. Um, and it would be wonderful sort of to wonder if, if Homer and those cats of yore actually created this thing from Olympus or they created it from experience. Alors, on a des questions ici, juste au milieu. Lorsque vous écrivez une histoire, when you, when you write a script, do you sometimes start from the end rather than from the beginning or, the, or start from the middle? No, no, no. I, I, I think I just made it clear. I don't write till I know every single scene and what pages are. Um, I, these things here, these exist before I write. So how can I start writing at the middle when I know every single page in the film? Uh, so, no, I, I, I have no idea. And I, and I also think uh, that it's just a wonderful way to fail if you, um, because you're just guessing. What you're, what you're doing there by writing in the middle or the end is 
you're just outlining. You're not really writing yet. You're just piecing seeds together. You haven't really gotten it down yet. And you can do that for months at a time and end up nowhere. Um, you know, when a student says to me, you know, I've got this script, I've been working on it three years, my heart sinks uh, because you know there's something wrong. And when they say, um, this isn't really much, I just did it in the last uh, couple of months, but maybe there's something there. I said, give it to me now. Um, because if it comes fast, it means it wants to happen. And it doesn't come fast if you don't, if you're not ready for it to come fast. It won't come fast if you're starting in the middle. Alors, il y avait des questions au milieu et ensuite, elle sera encore ici. Oui. Bonsoir. Good evening. You talked of the translation into pictures of the of the of the script, so the film is over. Do you consider that uh, during editing you should go back to the script, or just be completely cut off from the script when you're editing? Uh, well, the, the editor obviously has the, the script, and he's working from that. And if you've all done your jobs right, it will fall in place. Of course, others many cases where that doesn't happen. And, uh, and films, have, films have often been restructured in, during post-production. I work at a certain budget level that I don't like to shoot scenes that aren't going to end up in the movie because I could use that money to shoot scenes that are. So I try to be very, very rigorous. And if I'm shooting a scene and I got it, I said, let's do something else. I'm not going to spend another two hours on this. I want to find a spin and let's find some exteriors to shoot because I already got this scene. And when you have the courage to walk away from a scene, uh, it ties your hands in the editing room. And so it's not something I advise to a, a young director because everybody you know is going to say, shoot as much as you can, always shoot a master. I don't shoot masters anymore. I don't know, I hardly even shoot overs anymore. Uh, but here is one interesting exercise that I think works in editing, is particularly if your film is too long, which it often is, because you and the editor you fall in love with all the stuff you did. And uh, a good exercise is to say, let's just put in the scenes that we really love. We got an hour and 30 minute cut here. How many of these scenes are fabulous and really work like gangbusters? Okay, let's cut them together. How many are there? So now you maybe got 45 minutes left. The rest is all sort of mediocre or predictable or something. I say, well, we got 45 great minutes. How many more minutes do we have to add? How much of this other stuff do we have to put in? Uh, to make it make sense. And because when you're in an additive mode rather than a subtractive mode, you are much more creative. So if you're thinking, I've got a script that's 70 pages long and it works, then you're thinking, well, I'd have to be 85 or 90 pages. Well, what can I do? Well, I can add a new character. I could add a, a new little bit of action. I could bring in a comic relief person. And now you're thinking of making it better and more interesting. If you have a script that's 135 pages that has to be 95 pages, now you're thinking, how can I make it less? What can I take out? How can I, what characters can I lose? What lines can I lose? What locations? Same is true of editing. If you put yourself in the frame of mind of editing, of, okay, now I got a 50 minute movie that I really love. How much longer can I make it and make it still good? And, uh, and then you'll start to realize that some of those scenes that you thought were so indispensable really weren't. No. Bonsoir. Merci pour la masterclass. Good evening. Thank you so much for the masterclass. I have several questions about the canyons. Did you co-write or rewrite the script? Um, because in France, 90% of scripts are, are, are touched up rather than just done by script, script writers by themselves. And I was wondered 
whether you could talk to us about the uh, the metaphor in the canyons. I've seen it a while ago. Uh, well, it's not my metaphor. It's not my script. Uh, you know, it's Brett Lee's analysis. And I, I've essentially rewritten every script I've done with the exception of two. And that was Harold Penter and uh, Brett Ellis. And I, because I really liked their unique voice. And I wanted to... Um, uh, capture that voice. And the only thing I changed in Brett's script is he had, he had done the, the same scene twice by mistake. And, uh, and you're, you know, you're making a film on a low budget and I said, I'm gonna cut this scene out. And he said, no, that's a great scene. I said, no, but you, you already did that. I said, I'm not, I can't afford to shoot it twice. You know, which, which one would you rather have me cut out? But I'm gonna cut one of them out. Uh, but other than that, I uh, kept his voice. And his, you know, his theme is really about, you know, the uh, millennials and people who, who want to be in the movie business who don't like movies. You know, you know these, these people, they all want to be in the movie business, but do they actually like movies? Do they actually go to movies? No. That's very Brett. Um, you said that the, the metaphor is a driving force for writing. What are the similarities for you, or the, or the similarities and differences between what is uh, metaphorical and what is allegorical? Vous avez deux heures. Um, you have to write a paper. Um, I think the metaphor is a, is a proto-allegory, I guess. I mean, allegories come out of metaphors. So uh, if you get a good enough one, it will be an allegory, I guess. Uh, but uh, I have to be honest, I haven't even thought of that question. <laughs> um, hello. Hi. Could you talk a little bit about your um, process of uh, collaboration, both with directors and then maybe with producers? Which director? Or, well, any director. I mean, you're basically your process and how that... Uh, I'm not a it. very good collaborator. <laughs> and even with Scorsese, you know, we never sat in a room <laughs> together. I would write something and he would give me some feedback and I'd write it again. And... Uh, and I realized that during our fourth turn, when we did Bringing Out the Dead, that we would not work together again because we're, we're still friends. I, I heard from him today. But there were now two directors in the room discussing a script. Marty doesn't want two directors in the room. He only wants one director in the room. And I realized, I said, you know, this collaboration is over because I can't just be his writer anymore. And uh, so less and less, I, uh, more and more, I just do my own stuff. Uh, occasionally you have an odd situation where the thing with Brett comes by and you, and you say, you know, that'd be fun to do. But usually by the time a script gets financed, by a major entity, it's been, the soul of it has been kicked around the room so long that uh, it's not very interesting. Whereas in Brett's case, we were paying for it ourselves. We you know, do, it, do whatever you want. Bonsoir, vous avez parlé de... Good evening, you talked of uh, metaphors that you found either arriving at the hospital or with alcohol or with drugs or sleeping. Do you think you can find a good metaphor if you're in a non-modified state? No, no, no. The, uh, uh, well, let's talk about the new one. Um, I, I was thinking about punishment and what happens to someone who doesn't feel they have been punished sufficiently, who has uh, served their time in prison, 
and still feels they should be punished. I said, you know, that's an interesting theme, you know. And has his, it harks back to my Calvinist upbringing. And then I was watching some cable television. I was watching the World Series of Poker. I said, that's it, isn't it? These guys, they play poker 10, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. They're not alive. They're just little calculating machines. They've created a new prison for themselves because they don't believe they should be free. And then that's my metaphor, professional card player. And the problem is uh, the need for punishment. Now, where do I go with it? You know, and how do I take it somewhere? And so um, I think it's a little facile to assume that you have to be uh, in an altered state uh, to come up with a metaphor. And in fact, the uh, first reformed, I had always uh, resisted doing a film about the spiritual life. And then as soon as I decided to do it, of course, the spiritual crisis is quite simple. Uh, you know, uh, loss of faith. And the metaphor is a man who professes to have faith. And how does that express itself? Well, it expresses itself in the larger metaphor of the loss in faith in the planet. So now you're lining up loss of personal faith and loss of faith in our species. Well, that's a nice lineup. It's a nice metaphor. And when your theme and your metaphor are lined up right, sparks will go back and forth. Now, they can't be too close together because there won't be any sparks. Can't be too far apart. But you, you, you get them like this, and then also you tip them a little bit. You feel the spark. Make it off. A little more. Feel the spark. And uh, that's when you know your idea is alive because the sparks go, start going back and forth between... The, the cab driver and the lonely man. Bonsoir. Good evening. I have a question on affliction that I saw again last night. You decided to show the scene of the uh, funeral of the mother before showing the, 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 the discovery of the body, of the, of the death. I was wondering why you had done this in this order while the film is quite chronological on the whole. And was it a decision from you or was it in the book? Uh, if what you say is true, it was a decision by the projectionist who mixed up the reels. <laughs> because it's not that way in the film or, or the book. Okay. It's even more interesting. <laughs> and, but I didn't see the film, so I don't know, you know. It wouldn't be the first time they got the reels wrong. I know they got the ratio wrong. They started projecting that at 166, when in fact it was shot at 185. They told me at the second reel they would adjust it. I don't know if they did. But no, uh, unless they got the reels wrong, that didn't happen. <laughs> but people re misremember movies all the time, so don't be embarrassed. Merci pour la question. <laughs> Thanks for the question. <laughs> oui. um, bonsoir. On dit souvent qu'un film Good evening. Um, people often say that a film is written three times. When you write it down on paper in the shooting, at, when you edit it, you're a, 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 you're a director and a scriptwriter. Are you able to follow when you shoot what you've written on paper, or is there rewriting on the set? It's actually done four times. The fourth time is when you sell it, which is another movie altogether. Um, well, you know, hopefully what you have on paper and has gone through the rehearsal process, which is where it really is tested when actual human beings start playing these characters rather than imaginary ones. And you should have a pretty good handle on it in the rehearsal process. If something goes wrong on the set, that's not good. That means you didn't do the work you should have done in rehearsals. Now, there may be changes in, on the set, and you know, it may just be one of those days where somebody is off, or the 
plan you had to shoot it, you realize it's not good and you get a better idea. But those should be the exceptions to the rule. If you live in a world where every day you're making it up as you go, you know, that's called heaven's gate. Bonsoir. Uh, J'avais une question sur le scénario d'American Gigolo. Uh, le scénario comprend des I had a question on American Gigolo. The, in, in the, in the, in the, the film is a crime, or there's elements of crime story in the, in the script, but it's not, a, it's not strictly um, a crime story, it's more the portrait of, a, of, a, of Julian. And I was wondering, according to you, whether the crime story was a lever tool for the metaphor, because the metaphor needs to be well oiled, uh, or does it need to be well oiled to satisfy the audience, or, or can you do with that? Well, it's just a gimmick to keep the story going until you don't need it anymore. Uh, we were just talking about affliction. This is a, there's a, a shooting. And it's called a hunting accident, and our main character is convinced that it was a killing. And he's going to solve this killing. And now we have a murder mystery, and he's going around playing. He's a sheriff. He's doing his job. He's going to solve the murder mystery. And then at some point you realize there was no murder. This man is going crazy. And you, don't, you just forget about the murder. It never happened, and it wasn't a murder. But it took you all the way into the third act. And by the time the third act comes in, you say, okay, let's get rid of that damn murder plot. Now we're doing something much more interesting. Um, so often you use a kind of spur of a plot to get you through a section of the film to hold the audience in place uh, until you don't need that plot anymore. And you can, because often if you tell the audience, this is an examination of a soul in crisis from the get-go, you, know, you may lose them. So you say, no, no, this is not about a soul in crisis. This is, a, this is about a, a, a murder mystery, and we're going to solve it. And then you say, oh, halfway through, no, no, I guess it wasn't a murder. Une dernière question, malheureusement, car Just a, one last question, because Mishima will be screened, and hopefully the reels will be in the right order for Mishima. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. I had a question. I was wondering if you'd seen Joker by Todd Phillips and if you thought about it, because it's a film that's been compared to Taxi Driver in its treatment and, and the plot. And I was wondering whether you thought that it was possible to make films today that reach a large audience but are subversive, like this film, like Joker and like Taxi Driver was. Um, well, Joker certainly reached a large audience. I'm not quite sure how subversive it actually is. Um, and I, I've stayed away from that question because it's a, you know, it's a lose-lose answer. Because if I say taxi driver is better than Joker, people say he's resentful. And if I say uh, Joker is better than taxi driver, I'd be lying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Merci à vous.